Did Naomi suffer loss by the hand of the Lord? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Ruth on Walking Through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing Ruth chapter 1 verses 15 to 22, but before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Ruth chapter 1 verse 15, but if you don't have a Bible, don't worry, just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you, from me, parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. In our last lesson, we discussed Naomi's reaction to the death of her husband and two children. Not only had she been left widowed, but her two daughters-in-law had been left widowed too. The difference was that she was older and unlikely to marry, let alone have any more children, while her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, were still young and could still marry, and could still have children. That is why Naomi implored both of them to stay in Moab while she returned home to Bethlehem after hearing that the famine was over. Verse 15 says that Orpah agreed to stay in Moab. However, Ruth remained with Naomi. Naomi again implored Ruth to stay in Moab, but beginning in verse 16, we have Ruth's response to that. She requests that Naomi stop telling her to go. For she was determined to go wherever Naomi went, to lodge wherever Naomi lodged, and to die wherever Naomi died. Why would Ruth do that? Because after marrying one of Naomi's sons, she no longer saw herself as a Moabite. She saw herself as an Israelite. And she did not want to be a follower of the gods of the Moabites, for she had learned that they were false gods. She wanted to be a follower of Jehovah and him alone. Think about that for a minute. Without thinking too deeply into it, we might think that that reaction is natural. She married a follower of God, believed in God, and she wanted to remain a follower of God, a sentiment that might not have run as deep in Orpah. But let's remember, she had just lost her husband. Many people would blame God for this or question God's power or loving kindness for allowing this to happen. We're going to see a type of this attitude in Naomi a little later in this lesson. But Ruth wasn't like that. Not only did she desire to protect her mother-in-law, showing us her immense love for Naomi, but she had developed a deep faith in God that could not be shaken by earthly calamity. If Ruth never married again, she would be content. As long as she re remained with Naomi until Naomi died, something she took so seriously that she vowed that nothing short of her death would separate them, calling on God to do worse things to her than she was experiencing now if that didn't wind up to be the case, that's the type of faith she had. That is truly the example we should have in seeking, in seeking God in spite of trials. Naomi saw this and knew that she wasn't going to change Ruth's mind, so they began out on their journey from Moab to Bethlehem. Now, the route they could have taken was one of two routes, the northern route or the southern route. If Naomi and Ruth took the northern route, they would have crossed over the Jordan River in a similar place that Israel had crossed over in the book of Joshua. This would have placed them near Jericho, where they would have taken the ascent of Adumin, uh, passed by Jerusalem before coming down to Bethlehem. This would have been a hilly journey, but no better than the alternate route, which would have been the southern route. If they went that route, 
they would have crossed over near the bottom of the Dead Sea and wound up in the wilderness of Judah that bordered the Dead Sea. This arid desert place is full of hills, valleys, ca and caves, meaning that travel, though possible, would still be a chore. We will see this place when we come to the story of David running from King Saul in the book of 1 Samuel. Once you traverse this terrain, you could travel north to Bethlehem. Which route they took, we do not know, but when Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem, Naomi was recognized by the townspeople, and they were excited for her return. Naomi wasn't as excited, though, for she said that she returned empty, no husband or children, even though she left full, and for this reason she wanted to be called Mara, which meant bitter. It is ironic that Naomi should feel this way, for the entire reason Elimelech left Bethlehem was because of a famine. Even though the family left full in terms of people, they likely left empty in terms of food and possessions, thinking that they may obtain such in Moab. But that didn't end up being the case. Naomi and Ruth didn't appear to return with much. And what's worse, because Naomi returned with no husband or male heirs, what she had when she left Bethlehem, land and a home, was likely needed to be sold in order to meet for their current needs. Why did Naomi believe she was in this situation? because God had turned against her and was punishing her. This attitude was not uncommon among people of that time and is not uncommon today. Facing trials, it must be because God is angry with us and punishing us. Having times of happiness and wealth, it must be because God is for us and is blessing us because of that. That was the attitude of Job's friends in the book of Job, but that's not necessarily the case. Sure, God could punish us for our sins and allow trials to befall us. But it is also true that time and circumstance happen to us all. We live in a sinful world, and sometimes sinful people treat us poorly through no fault of our own, and we suffer for it. Illness and death happen because of sin, but not necessarily our sin, but sin in general and not having access to the tree of life. And then on the flip side, Jesus said that God sends the rain on the just and on the unjust, meaning that physical blessings does not equal a righteous standing before God. The story doesn't tell us whether God was punishing Naomi for sin or whether this was simply the circumstance of life. And when we don't know, we better be careful attributing it to God when it may not be so. That is a lesson for us today that we need to take to heart. The chapter ends by telling us that it was the barley harvest when Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem, meaning it was late March, early April, around the time of the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends, so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Of his cross.